In the pines, in the pines, where the sun never shines, you'll shiver when the cold wind blows. There's a grave in the pines, where the sun never shines, there's a grave that's shaded with the pines. Welcome, everybody, to the Land Between the Meadows. I'm your host today, Jameson Cable, and things are going to be a little bit different for this episode. In the current situation, me and Mr. Pope have not been able to get connected, so we're going to change it up a little bit. Seeing that we still want to put out good Kentucky history content, I'm going to be looking into some of the options we talked about a few weeks ago. I'll be doing a county-by-county history. Now, some of these episodes will be shorter than our typical episode length, but we're going to focus on one county For today's county, we're going to look at Lincoln County. Now, before we get started, I will remind you that you can connect to us on Twitter at KYHistoryPod, and you can also connect to us on Facebook at KYHistoryPod, or just search The Land Between the Meadows. Now, for this episode, we're going to focus on Lincoln County, Kentucky, mainly because we all know that Lincoln County is one of the first counties settled in Kentucky, and a lot of Kentucky's history connects to Lincoln County. We've had two or three episodes in the past that we've already talked about Lincoln County and the settlements in Lincoln County. So let's get started. Lincoln County, of course, can definitely take up the title of the mother of Kentucky counties because Lincoln County was one of the first three founded and a lot of counties were then broken off of Lincoln County as time went by and new settlements were formed. In 1772, Lincoln County was a part of Fincastle County, Virginia. And then in 1776, Kentucky County, Virginia was formed. Which brings us up to Lincoln County, was actually formed in 1780 by Virginia, along with Fayette and Jefferson County, being the first three counties in Kentucky formed. Lincoln County comes from the name of Benjamin Lincoln, who was a Revolutionary War officer. He was very interesting, to say the least, and really had nothing to do with the county. Many counties and even towns all over the country, and I should say more like the eastern part of the country, east of the Mississippi, have names and counties named after him, like Alabama, Georgia, North Carolina. And all these counties are always assumed that it's named after Abraham Lincoln, but actually it's old Benjamin Lincoln. But anyway, that's really about it. He has really no connection to Lincoln County besides being named after it. He got into politics, and in 1809, he died. Let's go on to the more important Benjamin. Benjamin Logan. He is known as the founder of Lincoln County and was a great frontiersman. But the story of Benjamin Logan arriving at Buffalo Springs must be told first before we get into the formation of Lincoln County's major towns like Stanford, also known as St. Asaph. I hope I'm saying that right. A-S-A-P-H, Asaph. I believe that's right. And Crab Orchard and other many towns and communities that form Lincoln County now. It starts with a letter from John Floyd. April 21st, 1775. I have now an opportunity by Jess McAfee to inform you that I am as far on my way to Kentucky as Powell's Valley and 12 miles of Cumberland Gap and shall proceed on my way tomorrow. Major David Robertson and his company are here and have waited for my coming. Mr. Drake, Mr. Madison, and their companies are lower down the valley 20 miles, making improvements. They told the major when I came to send for them and that they would go on with us. They had all been almost out of Kentucky, but on hearing of the murder, they this far to wait for me. I can't hear of any damage done since I wrote you. When Mr. Drake join me, we shall be at least 40 strong. I think we can force our way into the country, but it is a doubt with me whether we can subsist in so large a company. After we get there, and after the stock of provisions we now have is exhausted, Captain Howard, James Howard, with 42 men, had arrived at his last year's settlement before the McAfee's left these parts. But he had heard nothing of the damage which was said to have been done by the Indians to the families going down the Ohio which I before mentioned to you. The reason I bring up this journal entry by John Floyd and his expedition is because it is believed that with this group of men who were headed into the Lincoln County, Madison County, Rockcastle County areas towards Fort Boonesboro and Fort Herod, it is believed that Benjamin Logan was part of this group. And on this expedition or this voyage is when we, be, and is, is when we get to the point 
of setting up Stanford? Or is it the arrival of Benjamin Logan in Lincoln County? So once they arrive in what is now to now Stanford, they set up and plant their corn. Because at the time, if you came over to Kentucky and you planted corn and you grew corn, then you were then given given the land by the state of Virginia. The settlement was originally named St. Asaph because Floyd was a Welshman and his favorite saint was St. Asaph. And they arrived on St. Asaph Day. So therefore, the name was given. But the big debate on Benjamin Logan really lies at him getting there. At the time of Floyd's journal entry, there was another group of men he mentions, Henderson. And these this group of men were also headed towards Boonesboro. So the big debate is, who was Logan with for sure? Is there a 100% knowing of who Logan was with? Was he with Henderson or Floyd? But it's very easily analyzed and logically figured out that he was probably with Floyd. Floyd was from Virginia, Benjamin Logan was from Virginia, and Henderson was from North Carolina. It makes a lot more sense that Benjamin Logan would have been traveling with Floyd. So after the establishment of St. Asaph, Logan builds a cabin and plants his own corn to return to Virginia. In the following year, in 1776, he returns with his family, his wife, Jane, and his son, David. Interesting to note that he also returns with his slave, Molly, and her three sons, Matt, Dave, and Isaac. And then he starts building his fort. Also in 1776, the Revolutionary War begins, which you would think wouldn't have too much impact on settlements in Kentucky, but it actually does make its way there. In 1777, The fort is finally complete. We've talked about Benjamin Logan and Fort Logan before and forts in general in Kentucky in previous episodes. We've talked about the long stand against the Native Americans that they endured at Fort Logan. And we've also talked about how Boone was trialed in Lincoln County for his court-martial, him being captured and so forth. So I won't get into that too much. If you want to check those episodes out, you can go to the podcast and go back a few episodes. We talk about that plenty in depth. But I want to read a few more journal entries here. These are journal entries from Colonel Henry Hamilton of the British Army. The Revolutionary War is still going on, and it has made its way to Kentucky. But in this journal entry, Hamilton describes the fort. It is an oblong square formed by houses making a double street. At the angles were stockades bastions. The situation is romantic among wooded hills. A stream of fine water passes at the foot of the hills, which turns a small gristmill. They had been frequently alarmed and harassed by the Indians. Captain Logan, the person commanding here, had his arm broken by a buckshot in a skirmish with them. The people here were not exceedingly well disposed to us, and we were accosted by the females especially in pretty coarse terms. But the captain and his wife were very civil and tractable. At this point, with the fort structure, it had been enlarged a little bit, which we know it was not that big of of a fort. It was not as big as Boonesboro or Fort Herod. It was really not even half the size of those forts. Another excerpt from Colonel Hamilton's journal talks about his trip from Logan's Fort to William Willie's. The difficulty of marching through such country as this is not readily imagined by a European. The canes grow very close together, to the height of 25 feet, and from the thickness of a quirl to that of one's waist, he may have meant wrist in that part. As they are very strong and supple, the rider must be constantly on watch to guard his face from... The- <laughs> From them, as they fly back with great force, the leaves and young shoots are a fodder horses are exceedingly fond of and are eternally turning right and left to take a bite. The soil where they grow is rich and deep, so you plow through in a narrow track like a cow path, while the mosquitoes are not idle. Now, this is just an excerpt here from his journal that I thought was very interesting to kind of give a landscape of Kentucky at the time. A very thick forest narrow passageways, headed from one settlement to the next. And it does not sound like it's easy. It is not something that the colonel connects to European lands, where there's been a lot more settlers, probably a lot more clearing of the forest, and probably just an easier ride in general. Of course, the Revolutionary War ends, and that then sets us up for the founding of America, and then, of course, the founding of Kentucky. But before then, before Kentucky is founded... Virginia opens their first office on October 20th, 1779, at St. Asaph. Benjamin Logan had met all the requirements to get his certificate of his land and his owning. It goes as follows. Benjamin Logan, this day, claimed a right to a settlement preemption to a tract of land known by the name of St. Asaph, lying on the waters of Dick's River by raising corn and settling the land. 
in the year 1775, satisfactory proof being made to the court they are of the opinion that the said Logan has a right to a settlement of 400 acres including the said settlement and a preemption of 1,000 acres adjoining and that a certificate issues for the same. So Logan now has his fort, he has a settlement, and he's ready to set up shop. And ironically enough, he actually sends his family to Fort Herod because his fort is being attacked by Indians so much and he feels it's not safe. Another point to make real quickly about Benjamin Logan's family. He had about seven or eight, maybe even nine kids, but he only had one kid when he came over. And then he had the rest of them at, while he was living in Lincoln County at St. Asaph. Some notable things to think about while he was building this fort, he needed people to help. And it's very interesting to note that somebody who was with him was William Whitley. And again, we've talked about William Whitley before in previous episodes. So you can check him out in our backlog of episodes as well. Now, as far as Lincoln County goes, the court was first held at Fort Herod. And in 1781, Logan proposed and donated land for the court and other town necessities. In 1786, the courthouse was to be removed from the fort to the town of Stanford. This is the first time that the town is actually mentioned as Stanford. Now, this is my assumption and my guess only, and there's really there's no historical backing of this, but just my thoughts, is that whenever the town was first settled with the Floyd and Company settling and him maybe pushing the name of St. Asaph on the town, that then once Logan built his fort and he kind of claimed the land and was kind of the one doing the work, and the fort also had got many of nicknames because it had so many Indian raids on it and it was always so structured and fortified and would never fail to the Native Americans that it became known as the Standing Fort. So Stan Ford is how the name was formed. And I would think that maybe Logan was like, let's just go with Stanford because that's more of what I've created, not so much of this Saint Asaph that I don't really know much about, or that he wasn't really much, that he didn't really back as much. So that's just my personal thought. But another thing to mention is that Benjamin Logan's brother also accompanied him, and his name was Hugh. So let's talk about a little bit of frontier life. The many of these settlers and these places that were established dealt with many Indian raids. And when you look at some of the maps here about Lincoln County, and the, you get maps that have stations located on them. You have McKinney Station, Pettit Station, Montgomery Station, Davies, Whitley's, Bauman, Casey, Noblick, McCormick's, and Carpenter's. You have all these different stations. And basically, these were just places where people were setting up. People were setting up to start living and start farming and to make these places their own. And you can then, of course, look at places nowadays. You can look at McKinney. McKinney Station is where McKinney is at. You can look at Whitley. Crab Orchard is where Whitley was at. And a lot of these other stations match up to places that you know now. Uh, some of these early settlers, of course, Logan was one of them, Benjamin Logan, William Whitley. There were the McKinney brothers who settled in McKinney. And of course, there's many other different names and Adams, Bauman, Dozier, Dozier, Elliston and Nopes, and the many other families started settling here. Now, with this episode, I basically just kind of set the stage of Lincoln County. And now moving on to just some basic information about some of the towns in Lincoln County. Mainly you have Stanford. Stanford was the county seed once it was moved from Fort Herod to Stanford. There's a lot of historical information from Stanford. And then I would say the next or the next historical town or the next significant historical town would be Crab Orchard, which have the Crab Orchard Springs, William Whitley, and Sportsman's Hill. Don't forget also about Highland, Hubble, Houstonville. There's Kings Mountain, Millwood, McKinney was settled again at McKinney Station. There's Broughton Town, uh, Moccasin, Ottenheim, Preachersville, Rowland, Turnersville, and Waynesburg. All these different communities were set up, and a lot of them were set up way back when, 100, 200 years ago. A big factor in Lincoln County, and I would even suggest Crab Orchard, is the railroads, the rivers, and the roads. The first thing that you think of as settlers is the rivers. People came up Dix River, and settlements all go inside with rivers. Then after some time passes, the railroad. The railroad connected to Stanford and connected to Crab Orchard, and those places got more travel. And now, of course, in modern times, you have 150 and 27. Now, a lot of different historical events also took place in Lincoln County. You had the Civil War. I wouldn't necessarily say that Lincoln County had a big impact on the Civil War, but there were Confederate soldier, soldiers in Crab Orchard, Union soldiers in Waynesburg, Hall's Gap Battalion. There's many things that happened or connect to the Civil War. 
the newspaper. The first newspaper in Stanford was, I believe, the Stanford Banner. But it was then turned into the Interior Journal in 1875, which is still the newspaper today. So think about that. The Interior Journal is 145 years old. And you can still look at some of the articles from way back then. Some schools I'll quickly mention because I am a school teacher. You had the Christian Academy in 1858. You had the Crab Orchard College and Seminar in 1872. You also had the Stanford Female College. You had some other churches established way back in seven, the 1780s. Stanford Presbyterian Church was established in 1788. McCormick's Meeting House was built in 1785. You also had the United Baptist Church of Christ at Friendship, which was established in 1839. So that's going to wrap it up for this episode of the History of Lincoln County. Now, what I would like to do is in the next episode, I'll focus a little bit more on Stanford and then on Crab Orchard and then on the other surrounding communities and take it in a one step at a time discussion. I'll try to keep these between 10 and 20 minutes. I won't make them too long, mainly because I do not have all the resources I would like to have around me. I have a lot of informational books here at my house, but I'm not able to delve deep into, say, the library, who has loads of loads of information. There's actually a book about Benjamin Logan. It costs about $100, though, because it's not in publication anymore. So I would have to get it from a library. And at the moment, the libraries are closed. So I can't get too much into some of these other ones. Maybe me and Mr. Pope can have another longer discussion about, say, Benjamin Logan and maybe even Benjamin Lincoln. But what I would like to do is continue to talk a little bit about Lincoln County's history in these shorter episodes and go from one community to the next and kind of build an overall history of just this county. And again, we'll then, I'll then move over to another county and start looking into that county. Now, some other things that I'm looking into are some oral histories. I had planned out many interviews I was going to do with local people around the communities so that we could get a first person account of the history of the community. However, I can't do that now because of the situation we were in. But I did find out about the Kentucky oral history and also the Lincoln County oral history. You can check those places out if you would like and search them on Google and you'll find them pretty easily. But they have many, many archive recordings of different people around Kentucky and the communities they are in. Now, if you don't want to look into them, that's okay because I'm going to be looking into them and putting them onto the podcast. And just trying to get the word out that these historical items are available to us. With that being said, I hope you enjoyed this little quick discussion on the history of Lincoln County. I have a few other ideas. I think I might, since I have a little bit of time on my hands, try to turn this into a YouTube video as well and put up some pictures that I have here and on the computer that show a little bit of history of Lincoln County and give you more of a visual. Again, we're also, we're also in the process of creating a website so you could have a central hub of everything Kentucky history. Now, with that being said, I hope you enjoyed this little discussion about the history of Lincoln County and then, hey, maybe you learned something. Or maybe I got something wrong and you need to tell me about it. Or if there's anything you would like to add, please contact us and let us know. Don't forget, in these times of unusualness, differentness, isolation, we're all in this together. I'm going to stick with what Governor Brashear said. Team Kentucky, and we're in this together, Kentucky. Thank you for listening, and stay safe.